To remain updated with the latest business news, click on the bell icon. Hello and welcome. You're with us here on Business Today. I'm Abha Bakaya. Today we take a deep dive into our cover story this time around, where we focus on the two big players taking forward ambitions in the renewable energy space. Both Adani and Ambani have announced major spending and major plans for the renewable space going forward. What does this mean uh, for both companies, for India's ecosystem and for overall growth going forward? We have a fantastic panel with us here to discuss that. Let me introduce Vibhuti Garg, Energy Economist Lead India. Institute for Energy Economics and Financial Analysis. We have Gaurav Sood also with us, CEO at Spring Energy, Siddharth Jain, MD, MEC Plus, and Krishna Gopalan, Deputy Editor at Business Today magazine. Krishna, before I go across to our panelists, let me get a sense from you on the factors that were explored in the cover story this time around. Yes, Abba, thank you very much. Uh, I would certainly like to highlight a few points. One, I think renewable as a source of energy is a complete non-negotiable issue as we speak. It means every country has to do exact, to take exactly that particular route. So keeping that as the backdrop, this is really where the interest for large number of corporates like Reliance and Arani has started to emerge. So our cover story in that sense really spoke of the big ticket investment that the two groups have announced. Uh, Arani has promised to put in $20 billion, Reliance $10 billion. So when we have two of India's largest business groups committing as much as $30 billion, the state is pretty well set for the most fascinating story that's waiting to play out. Uh, I just want to point out one more thing. Uh, we are speaking of technology. We are speaking of big ticket money. What you're hoping for is scale, which will eventually bring down the cost of technology to the consumer. So I think that period leading up to the issue of renewable energy being accessible to all and at an affordable price will be the most fascinating story to track. Absolutely. Yeah. So let me start off with you, Vibhuti, and try to understand the landscape here, how critical some of these ambitions are going to be, uh, you know, when it comes to uh, the India narrative also going forward. Uh, you know, we've had the Prime Minister talk about net zero emissions, uh, setting the tone for uh, being a major player on the world stage as well. Talk to us about the overall landscape first before we get into really where both companies are headed. Yeah. So if you look at India's electricity sector, it is going under huge transformation. So the electricity mix, which was heavily coal dominated, the share of it is now declining and the share of renewable energy is increasing. Uh, the share of RE has gone up from less than one to two percent just a decade ago to now 10 to 12 percent in overall generation. Um, and this is likely to further go up to, you know, 30% or 50% in the next few years. And when the government wants to achieve the net zero target, it's going to go up to as high as 80, 85% uh, by 2070. So now, uh, with more than 100 gigawatts of renewable energy on its grid, uh, India is now commencing what we will call it as a chapter three of its clean energy story. The first chapter began by, way back in 2010 when the government set a 20 gigawatt solar capacity target by 2020 under the national solar mission. Five years later in Paris at the 2015 uh, COP21, India agreed to build significant renewable energy capacity and to have a 40% of electricity on the grid coming from renewable energy sources by 2030. 2016 onwards, the chapters two, two began wherein you know uh, we saw declining uh, solar and wind energy tariffs and a trend which is still ongoing uh, and we are expecting the renewable energy tariff to further go down mm -hmm. and it is now far more cheaper than the average coal-fired power tariff uh, in the country. The next chapter of India's clean energy story will be the most critical one. The challenge will be to step up the rate of activity threefold so as to accelerate the decarbonization of the most energy intensive components of the economy, the electricity, the transport and the industrial sector. And Prime Minister Modi's announcement at COP26 kind of signals that India has the right intent and now we need increasingly access to finance that will be critical in India achieving these climate ambition goals. Having tracked the industry for such for so many years, 
would you agree with us when we say that this remains by far the most interesting phase as far as RE is concerned? Absolutely. Uh, we are seeing increasing deployment of renewable energy. We are seeing increasing investment into the clean energy space. And not just by a few players uh, with all these net zero announcement and carbon neutral announcement being made by a lot of state governments as well as public and private institutions like uh, even uh, Indian Railways has committed to 2030 carbon neutral uh, as well as other companies like NPPC, which has been largely the major thermal dominated player has now kind of uh, committed that they will not build any new greenfield coal based power project. So all this is quite exciting and uh, with enhanced ambitions, I think uh, we will see a lot of activities, a lot of interest from not only national as well as global players in India. And India is a hub uh, or a very attractive renewable energy uh, country that is being touted as, and there's a lot of interest from all kinds of stakeholders and players nationally as well as internationally. Siddharth, let me get you in here now. Let's talk about the two big names that are driving this agenda forward in the private space, both Ambani and Adani. Uh, diving in here, firstly, how would you differentiate between the plans that the two giants uh, have for the space? I think, uh, you know, first of all, the amount of investment that both have committed, that's quite huge. You know, $30 billion is almost equivalent to uh, the amount of capital that has gone into renewable energy so far. I mean, in the last five years, 60 gigawatt of renewable energy has been put in the ground. And that is equal to around $30 billion of total investment. And that is, these two players are kind of announcing that. And the second thing that is very, very interesting about them is that they are not only focused on the generation assets, but they want to also go into the supply chain and the technology. I mean, both have announced uh, you know, plans to do backward integration. Adani already has some manufacturing and uh, they want to kind of go backward integrated into that. They've also kind of announced their in desire to invest into hydrogen electrolyzers. Reliance, on the other hand, has announced partnership with Seastyle. They are uh, kind of working on a low cost hydrogen electrolyzer. They Adani has also announced uh, investment in fuel cells. Of course, we got factory around storage and uh, solar panels so there is this is the first time we are seeing that you know investment is not only on the uh, side of generation assets which has been the main focus of the last five six years but also in the technology and the supply chain and the second uh, you know, the third aspect that comes to that is that this is uh, going to be essential to reduce the cost going forward because so far the cost has been coming down because of the uh, global uh, investment that have been going in technology but now when we are localizing here in India, we would expect the cost down. Where they differentiate a bit is where at least what we see is that uh, Alliance has had a lot more global uh, approach towards uh, partnerships and announcement. Uh, and uh, the uh, Adani group has had a lot more uh, focus on regulated assets and building capacity there. And it remains to be seen how that kind of converged or diverged going forward. But uh, this, you know, industry being set up globally at a scale which is then the SARS with the localization, that's a huge thing for India and can also give impact as to us as a technology hub going forward. So that at the same time, uh, the thumb rule indicates that about one fourth comes from equity and three fourth comes from debt. So yes. do you see a serious amount of challenge by way of these companies having to raise money at some point? Yes, yes. I mean, uh, every company in renewable energy will need to raise capital. Renewable energy is one of the most capital incentive intensive sectors out there. I mean, if you put that on a graph, renewable energy is right on top in terms of the amount of capital that it takes to uh, work. So everybody in this sector would need to raise capital at some point in time. And, uh, you know, even now, most, most every company in India is... Uh, raising capital or has raised capital and almost every big financial player in the world is invested into it there. So that's the kind of flow that has been happening. This is also the story that will continue to happen. But uh, what makes the, these two players unique is that because of their own very strong balance sheets, they can take a larger amount of risk and they can go for a larger amount of scale 
and reduce that risk before they raise the finance. So it's a big advantage that these companies have. Gaurav, let's get you in then and talk about solar versus renewable, solar versus hydro and uh, you know why the preference and what's the potential when it comes to the different uh, sources as well. Thank you. Uh, so solar, very clearly, you know, India is, uh, as a country has a very good resource uh, and leaving few states uh, in the northeast, I think the generally the solar irradiation uh, across the country is very good, uh, which which makes India an apt uh, country for uh, installing solar in, in a massive scale. Uh, when it comes to compared to let's say other uh, non-fossil technologies, be it wind, in India, wind again uh, there is a substantial capacity installed, but uh, it's primarily concentrated, uh, um, let's say in Gujarat, Tamil Nadu, uh, and, and few other states, yeah. and let's say Karnataka, Andhra, and uh, uh, maybe MP to some extent. Yeah. So these are the key states for wind. Whereas, as I said, in, in India. You can set up solar across the country. Of course, uh, setting up uh, in Rajasthan would make the most sense uh, because the radiation is amongst the highest in the country. Land uh, as a resource which we require in a large quantum, we require around four acres of land for every megawatt peak of uh, installation. Hence, uh, 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 you know, land uh, which, which is very critical, we are able to get large tracts of uh, uh, unutilized land or wasteland in Rajasthan, which can be put to uh, great use. Uh, and, and that's why, you know, a large, I think Rajasthan stands out as the largest state uh, in terms of installation, uh, followed by others. So, so that, I think that's more from the resource point of view. Uh, once again, uh, other than resource, I think it's the, uh, the way the cost curve has, uh, um, let's say, move, uh, uh, moved in terms of the solar technology. There has been a lot of innovation on the solar technology. Uh, within uh, photovoltaic technologies, we have seen, uh, you know, initially we had a lot of polysilicon. Now, then we move to mono, now bifacial, and other technologies uh, will also be coming. So, as a result of that, we, we are able to, uh, you know, see a lot of investment going in these technologies, which is leading to improvement in efficiencies and lowering of costs. Because of this, the capex uh, has uh, come down substantially. The uh, the the generation per megawatt has gone up, which makes the LCO most competitive from solar, and that is precisely the reason I think even in the plan set up by the government or the CA projections, solar will form the dominant uh, share of uh, renewable technology, followed by wind uh, and other uh, technologies uh, as 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 we will see in the mix, all the technologies play their own critical role, but solar would surely stand out. Gaurav, that's most interesting, but at the same time, if you could perhaps outline a couple of challenges that we need to ready ourselves for uh, as we get into what looks like the most interesting journey. Sure, uh, Krishna, um, you know, as other panelists mentioned, we are in the midst of this energy transition, not only India, but globally. Uh, and uh, it needs to be looked at as a, a massive uh, uh, investment opportunity um, rather than, you know, uh, some, let's say, existing stakeholders feeling uh, um, concerned about their existing investments. But since uh, this transition is inevitable, we will see a large renewable deployment. Uh, uh, you know, some, some countries going to the extent of 70 to 80 percent of renewables on the grid. And India would also have a dominant share of the same in its energy mix in the next decade or so. Uh, so when we look at the challenges, if we have to overcome this transition, uh, I'm going to say one, of course, is the uh, is the key point uh, where so much of demand is going to arise. Um, that's the first uh, key important point. And I think there, um, you know, the last couple of years have, uh, you know, world over uh, economies have slowed down, so so has been the case in India. But uh, with the economies opening up, uh, this growth should pick up and power demand should get created. Uh, we have to be mindful that, uh, you know, the energy intensity uh, per consumer uh, consumption of energy is, is, is very low in India. Uh, and hence, as the uh, economy develops and, and generally mm, uh, the, the, the economy grows, 
we will see this energy intensity uh, of India uh, further rising. So along with the general growth, the energy consumption per capita goes up, both uh, leading to a great increase in demand. So once the demand issue is addressed, I think the other uh, key critical point is who is going to buy this power uh, and how bankable are those operators. I think uh, that's, that's a key point because at the end of the day, Till today, a large part of the power uptake happens through long-term power purchase agreement, agreements. Uh, now, the, now the exchanges have started opening, but still the short-term transaction uh, in the power sector is very limited. So I would say 90 to 95 percent of the power is uh, sold through long-term power purchase agreements. So what's very important is the financial health of the distribution companies. Um, now we have another, uh, let's say, uh, second alternative as corporates are, the, are Starting on their journey towards the net uh, zero, uh, there is a lot of interest from corporates in uh, buying uh, green power, but still uh, the dominant share would always be with the distribution companies. Uh, and hence, uh, the government has been taking some very effective measures. Some are, uh, for example, uh, you know, there, there are a lot of amendments being proposed in the Electricity Act, which have to still go through, but are very critical and the states uh, across the country need to support it to make that happen. Uh, there have been various other measures such as, uh, you know, giving must run status to renewables, um, um, then uh, followed by, uh, you know, opening of LCs, having very strong uh, payment security mechanisms, improving the contracts, um, you know, making the evacuation available for this large quantum of power which is going to come on the grid. Right. So I think that's the second key point. How do we make the entire ecosystem uh, of our off takers more bankable, which will allow uh, trillions of dollars in terms of uh, investments coming from from the generation side, on the transmission side, and, and third, equally important would be the privatization uh, of the distribution sector, which is also a very key uh, key aspect which the government is trying to move towards, which is very important, so that uh, at the end of the day, the end customer has the option. To choose uh, the right service provider, like what we do in telecom. Uh, uh, similarly, we should be having uh, right. options to choose the right, uh, uh, you know, off takers there. So that 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 I think put together uh, mm -hmm. is, is what would be the way forward. All right. So so closing comments then, Vibhuti. I want to bring you in again on on really. Uh, you know the way forward with these two majors uh, these two corporate behemoths that have uh, decided to really step up the game and go at it when it comes to the renewable space you know according to you what's the biggest challenge what's the biggest opportunity and uh, you know what's the kind of horizon you're looking at going forward in, in the light of the kind of announcements that we've seen from both ambani and adani um in terms of timeline, I would say that 2030 would be critical. Mm -hmm. So India has also set huge targets of net zero by 2070, but you know, the short term goal, goals are really more critical. And these, both the players, Reliance and Adani will play a big role because they are, because of their huge size, they'll be able to get in uh, one of the latest technologies and by building it, on the ground in India, they'll be able to drive the cost down. So these are the kind of benefits that these two players can bring in and with their strong balance sheet and with the uh, good performance of their earlier assets, they will be able to tap a lot of uh, capital, not only in India, as I said, but global capital as well. The challenge in terms of what lies ahead is policy certainty. Mm -hmm. And uh, other panelists have already spoken about how critical is for in the electricity sector in particular, uh, the financial health of distribution companies. So the off taker risk needs to be minimized. The policy certainty has to be there. And uh, definitely there's political intent, but if it combines with the policy certainty, we will see these two big players kind of contributing uh, and kind of uh, being the pioneers for energy transition in India. Right. Siddhartha, let me get closing comments from you as well. And in terms of, you know, how it's really going to change the game today, where we're seeing India at the cusp of uh, a major shift in terms of uh, uh, their uh, 
you know, commitment uh, to this agenda is quite clear. Having two of the biggest conglomerates come into this space and, you know, set the pace for it, set the bar so high, how is this going to cause a significant shift and help us to accelerate in our pace and in, in, in an attempt to really reach those targets? Yes. So uh, the target of the government is to kind of install, you know, uh, 400 gigawatt of new energy uh, into the ground in mm. the next 10 years. Right now it's around 400 gigawatt. So that's a huge target yeah. requiring yeah. very large execution scale capabilities. So A, you know, these companies have been executing some very complex projects in the past. If you look at the scale, the way they handle the portfolio of assets that they have built, it's quite, uh, you know, quite commendable the amount of uh, expertise that they have in this. Mm. B, I think what is happening is that with the ability to uh, get the technology in into the country, they would be able to reduce the cost further, make India a leader. Some of the announcements indicate that we have kind of made world meeting announcements already on the price at which we would probably produce hydrogen and the amount of scale at which we are going to set up those factories. So we see a lot of global play coming in from that part of the uh, you know developments there. And the thirdly, I think what will happen is that these two large players bring with them a lot of cross synergies across the different parts of the economy. And being able to see the inefficiencies across the different parts of the uh, economy that they are operating in, they are able to find more sustainable solutions. They are able to find those solutions which make it work. Like Gaurav was mentioning that, you know, there is a requirement for corporates and there is an electricity act, but I also feel that at the same time, the industry needs to kind of offer solutions uh, to the government, to the players, and these players, because of their cross-sector expertise, kind of brings that. And fourthly, uh, I think that you know the industry has been maturing uh, over the last five years. I would say it was the time when the industry was kind of getting incentives and requesting uh, you know relaxations from the government. Now, the lower hanging fruits have all been plucked. It is all about now getting into solution mode, providing governments answer to sure. you know, how the intermittency can be solved, how transmission can be solved, and how you know they can come up with solutions where they can find out new contracts which can help the government meet the targets. So I think it's a win-win situation and very excited about the phase that will come. Gaurav, uh, let me get your uh, closing comments as well. And do you feel these two giants will be able to do what we haven't yet seen or we've only seen, uh, you know, to a certain extent or with select players in the renewable space so far? Will they manage to change the ecosystem when it comes to, uh, you know, when it comes to the energy segment here in India? So I think uh, India has had a very successful rollout of renewables so far. But one thing which one thing which has been missing in this journey is a strong domestic manufacturing industry. Uh, all the more true for solar. Mm. Uh, and I, I feel with the announcements which have been done by a couple of these players, sure. uh, at, uh, combined with the PLI schemes which the government is bringing, that manufacturing ecosystem, a vertical, let's say, vertically integrated uh, solar uh, value chain right from polysilicon to panels, Similarly, on the energy storage side, on the batteries, similarly on the green hydrogen for, for electrolyzers, I think that's something for India to really have a meaningful energy transition or to be really energy uh, secure and independent. Uh, we have to have a very strong domestic manufacturing sector and especially the announcements from Reliance and hopefully many more uh, players will, will, be the, will be that, will be bridging this missing gap which is the need of the art. So I think the real Atam Nirbhata, which the government has been talking about, is, is a key component for this energy transition. And we are very hopeful as an industry, as professionals, we are very happy that we will have a strong domestic supply chain in the years to come uh, once the PLI schemes and the plans of these corporates take place, in addition to a lot of capital which is going to flow. I, I don't see there is scarcity of capital. Uh, there will be multiple in this industry, but but these players will definitely make an impact on the manufacturing ecosystem. 
Krishna, as, as the person who did the deep dive into the story uh, and after, of course, hearing all the different uh, insights coming in from our panelists, which are the questions that remain and which we look forward to perhaps answering over time? Well, I, I must be completely honest. I think we have to consider ourselves remarkably fortunate to go through a period like this because it's going to be a period of tremendous learning for all of us. That's one. But more importantly, I think the worry, if at all, uh, comes to mind is absolute policy certainty. The last thing one needs is a set of nasty surprises to come in and upset the apple cart. So I think if we get it right in policy, get it right in terms of intent, I think we're really on to quite a fascinating journey. Gentlemen and Vibhuti, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, great uh, to hear from all of you and really get a perspective on what's in store when it comes to uh, the huge developments in the renewable space. That's uh, our take on the cover story this issue of Business Today magazine. Uh, do catch it on the stand. That's all from us for now. Thanks so much for watching. If you like the video, do like, comment, share and subscribe.